happen. We'll be having a discussion. Um, and so I would uh, invite all of you to participate in this ongoing discussion that we were having. Uh, the way we do this is that we, um, you can ask questions in the channel, and I will answer them as best I can. I would suggest um, that, um, uh, that you give me 30 seconds to respond to them. And um, the folks over at Higher Things have also been instructed that if I do say they see a question and I don't see a question, uh, for them to text it to me. And so here we go. Um, all right. And away we go. Um, I want you to, uh, I don't know how far we'll get today because we have a lot to do, but I want to take you back to our dear friend Moses. Remember we had uh, the end of <laughs> Enoch, Enoch, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Um, anyway, we had um, Enoch walking with God and he was not for God took him. And we had this being the picture of how it is between us. Um, and I want you to, to sort of hear this Luther quote again. Here too, we are reminded of our sin. If Adam was not, had not sinned, we would not be mortal men. But like Enoch, we would, without fear or pain, be taken out of this physical life to another better and spiritual life. Now we would have lost, we have lost that life. This story points us, points out to us that we must not despair of having paradise and life restored to us. The flesh indeed cannot be without pain. But since the conscience has been quieted, death is like a fainting spell through which we pass into rest. That pain of flesh would have been absent in the innocent nature, for we would have, have taken it as sleep and awaking shortly. We would have been in heaven and would have lived an angelic life. But now, when the flesh has been corrupted by sin, it must be destroyed by death. So, perhaps when he was lying in the same place, covered with grass and praying, fell asleep. That's Enoch. And as he slept, he was taken by God without pain and without death. Death for us now is sleep. Death, which is our enemy, which is, which is the undiscovered country, says um, Hamlet. Uh, death has been swallowed up in the death of the Son of Man, the Son of God. And now that Christ lives, raised from the dead, our death is but a nap. So Enoch is a picture of how it is with us where Christ is king. When Methuselah was 170, he was fathered by Lamech. Methuselah lived another 782 years after having fathered, after having follow, fathered Lamech and sons and daughters. And thus the days of Methuselah were 969, and he died. And when uh, Lamech had lived 182 years, he followed, fa uh, fathered a kid named Noah. Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us comfort from our work and from the painful toils of our hands. So, Noah comes to bring comfort. And that's, that's something to, to remember when it comes to, to all of this. God wants to comfort. God wants to save. God wants to have a people. He be God. They be his people. Um, he loves his creation. He doesn't hate anything he's created. So Noah comes in order to bring comfort to God's people. Did Lamech think... Uh, Lamech think that Noah really did he think that Noah was going to be the savior of the world Luther thinks so oh you like those but you don't like the other ones huh so Luther thinks that Lamech thought that it was time that this babe Noah would bring comfort by the forgiveness of sins. Good catch, buddy. Let's continue.
Noah lived 500 years, fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, uh, this is a, um, a different construction. 32 is a different construction than everything that went before. Um, everything that went before is um, when Lamech lived 182 years, he fathered a son. Lamech lived after he fathered, fathered Noah and had many other sons and daughters. Here, um, it just simply says that uh, Noah was 500 years old. He fathered, or he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And there is, um, there is a, a sort of a, um, uh, um, there is this sort of hint that these three may be tri triplets, triplets, triplets. But, but here you have Noah who's going to bring comfort. Um, now, before we get to the, 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 the Noah episode, I want one more Luther quote because it, it really, really, really helps us have an idea on what, um, what Luther thinks. So this story, the Enoch story, is an, a notable one. Um, through it, God desired to impart to the first and primordial world, primeval world the hope of a better life after this life. Later on in the second world, which had the law, God gave the example of Elijah, who was taken away by the Lord, even as his servant Elisha was looking on. We are in the New Testament, or in a world as it were, where we are more outstanding example of eternal life, and that is Christ himself our deliverer, ascending into heaven with many other saints. In every age, God wanted to have hand proofs of the resurrection of the dead in order to draw out our hearts away from the detestable and troubled life in which as long as it seems good to God, we nevertheless serve him by performing our governmental and civil duties and also above all else by leading others to godliness and the knowledge of life. But here we have no continuing place for Christ went away to the Father to prepare us for eternal dwellings. And so, this account, this tola dot, with, with Enoch as, as a picture of eternal life, followed by, by Noah having, um, followed by, by Noah having this, um, the son that being the son who who they believed would bring comfort gives us an idea of how how Luther saw the world. All right, now we got to be aware of this. A lot of people, even good Lutherans today, think law in the garden, gospel in the New Testament. Now we're back under the law. We'll even sort of phase our sermons this way with law gospel law or law gospel response. Um, that's not how the, that's not how Luther sees the Old Testament. Luther sees the world that we've had up to this point, the world that is pre-fall as a gospel world, a world in which they looked and longed for the forgiveness of sins, which would be one and achieved for them by the crushing of the serpent's head. And an Enoch provides for them a living hope of resurrection. The second world, the world of the law, is the law of Sinai, which isn't the world that God is wanting to get back to. That's, that, that, that's just a messed up sort of thing. If you think the end all was God to put you back under the law, then you have totally misunderstood everything that's happened to Genesis to this point. The intention was always that you would believe in his son. The intention was always that Yahweh would be your God and that you would be his people. It was not, hey, let me give you a law that you can't follow. Let me save you from that law in the New Testament so that I might put you back under the law in the life of the world to come. 
as if you finally get to paradise and you're like, all right, I'm doing the law now. This is exemplified in the Reformed by the idea that Jesus saves you by grace alone. Now you got to work. Really? He's done. Elvis has left the building. I want this quote for you. In the New Testament, God's mercy is truly superabundant. We'll get to that word again. Although we do not discard accounts of this kind, we nevertheless have far more important ones, namely the Son of God himself ascending to heaven and sitting at the right hand of God. In this event, we see that the head of the serpent has been completely crushed and the life which we lost in paradise has been restored. This is far more the fact that Enoch and Elijah were, tra uh, this is far more than the fact that Enoch and Elijah were translated. And yet in this matter, God wanted to give comfort to the first world and to follow the following one, which had the law. And so the world that we're reading about right now is a world that doesn't have the law. Um, it has natural law written on people's hearts, but Sinai and under the law, no siree, Bob. What we have in the New Testament is a super abundant example of Elijah and Enoch and comfort, comfort Noah. The New Testament provides the super abundant, what I like to say hyperbolic, ness hyperbolicness superabundantness of what we're seeing now okay god walking with enoch and taking him away or uh, luther translates that taking him to himself is nothing compared to what we see in the suffering and death of jesus and his ascension which is our suffering and death and our ascension and beware of anyone who wants to the gospel to be something other than superabundant, hyperbolic, and the like. There are Christians, even Lutherans, who get a little upset about the idea that the gospel could be so wonderful. But to Noah, to Lamech, to Enoch, the gospel was hyperbolic. The gospel was over the top, and they longed for it. They begged for God to save them. Therefore, this is the main doctrine set forth in these five chapters, says Luther, that man, men have died and have lived again. Through, through, through Adam, all have died. However, those who believe it have lived again through his, his promised seed, as the history of Abel and Enoch proves. In the instant of Adam, Seth, and the others, their death is indicated, for thus it is written, and he died. But in the instance of Abel and Enoch, the resurrection of the dead and e everlasting life are manifested. And the purpose of all of this is to keep us from despairing of death and give us a firm conviction that those who believe in the promise, the promised seed, will live and be taken to God, be it from water, fire, the gallows, or the tomb. Therefore, we desire to live, and we must live, says Luther, live in the eternal life which, through the promised seed, comes after this life. This is not just historical information. This is about Jesus. You read this about, oh yeah, very interesting, Lamech, you're missing it. This whole chapter, everything that has come before, has been about God saving you. They were hoping for it, and they got it. But it wasn't in Noah. Noah's a big fat failure too. That is not to shame Noah's weight. I'm just saying, he's a failure. He's going to fail too. Every one of them is going to fail. As they wait for, as they long for the true comfort. See, this is what the scriptures are all about. God saving you. If you forget that, turn it into a how-to book, a historical account, a science book. You're missing the point. That is not to say that the Bible has errors. I never said that. But what I am saying is 
This is about God saving you. Every page is about God saving you. That's what it's about. Are there stuff about how to live? Yes, there are. Um, should you do that? Yes, you should. Lester Co. don't invoke Buto's name. But this is what's so important about this, that you understand that all of these five chapters, Adam and Eve and the fall, Abel and Cain, and that other church, Cain's church, that leads to death, the line of Seth, all the way through Enoch, who was raised from the dead, or taken before he died, Lamech, Noah, the comforter. All of it is about God sending his son to crush the serpent's head to save you. This is the way to read the scriptures. Because this is the way Jesus says to read the scriptures. And if you get upset with me about that, then talk to Jesus about it. Because he's the one that points to the scriptures and says, these are the things which testify of me. But we are in this in this, this is sort of boxed in rut that we want the law. We want to end on the law. We want to have to have the law because we want Lestico to prove his behavior. Who doesn't? But that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is to point you to the resurrection from the dead, that there is one who's going to come to save you. So Noah waits 500 years. What an amazing cat he is. To Father Shim, Ham, and Japheth. Hi, Pat. Good to see you. And they're probably triplets. My best guess. Shim, Ham, and Japheth. I don't have a problem with that. If you read that as triplets, then go for it. Chapter 6. Remember the two churches. The line of Cain and men. The line of the sons of God. Shem. I'm sorry. Seth. Uh, um, and the uh, the men, uh, the Adam man, um, began to multiply over all the face of the Adama, over all the face of the earth, and um. Daughters were born to them. Okay, that's not to say that we didn't have daughters before. Um, we just didn't, they weren't mentioned. Um, they were mentioned that they had many sons and many daughters, but uh, men begin to, we, we start a new section here where men be, were, were, were the, um, where Moses points out men were multiplying and daughters were born to them. And the sons of God, the Bene uh, Ha Elohim, the sons of God, um, saw the Yara that the daughters of men were desirable. They were uh, 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 they were tov, they were pleasant, and so if you're if you're sort of Thinking about this at home, um, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were pretty. And they were like, hello, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? And these were like, oh, son of God, this magic moment. All right. Um, before you get 
like um, thinking that what's about to happen is going to create Superman. That these are angels and uh, these are are humans. Um, I would I would pause for a second and think of who the sons of God. Um, if only I had hand puppets. What a great idea, Erica. I will get right on that. But I, I think a better way of thinking about that is that up until this point, there has been two lines. Cain, Seth, and never the two have joined. Well, the sons of Seth, who are the sons of God, who believe in God, see the daughters of Seth in his line as simply irresistible. And so the next thing you know, they put a little Marvin Gaye, let's stay together, and this is what we got. Which, by the way, is a real problem. Because these guys hate God and live for themselves, and these guys believe in a Savior that is going to come. These guys, they don't think a Savior is going to come for them. God's marked their great, 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 great grandfather, Cain, to a life of wandering. And this side's Lamech, who we were left with, is an awful murderer who's worse than Cain. But this guy's Lamech is Noah's dad. And so don't go like alien here where these are angels and these are, are, um, are uh, men and they get together and they create the Nephilim, the giants. Um, I would say these are the children of God. These are not. And they get together. Uh, because these guys sing, I'm so in love with you. And, and, they, and they, they, there they go. All right. Um, and the problem here is whenever God's people join with people who are not God's people, they end up doing the things that not God's people do. And God knows it. This is why they weren't to, to, to marry the Canaanite. It's not racist. It's because... When a good Hebrew marries a non-Hebrew, he ends up taking on the non-Hebrew's religion. It happens every single solitary time. Angels and women. Right. Didn't I say that? Lestico? I thought I said that. Sons of God, the angels, and the daughters of men, people. And I, 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 I'm with Luther on this. Yeah, no, reject it. I, I don't. I, that's not what's going on here. You're, you're free. It's not going to change anything if that's what you're thinking, but it, it doesn't fit with the rest of the text and everything that has been going on up to this point. Luther, it is the characteristic and continuing work of God that he condemns the most eminent, casts down the powerful, shakes the most brave, even though they are his creatures. But he does this to frighten the ungodly and to awaken us with more, many awe-inspiring examples of his wrath that we may learn to despair of ourselves and to trust in his grace alone. So this whole section with God executing judgment by means of flood is about God saving his people. So God does it law for law's sake. God laws for the gospel's sake. He executes judgment in order to call to repentance. And the problem with the sons of God who believe in a Savior joining with the sons of men is that they're going to compromise on the first table of the law. And this is something important. We, 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 we always think when it comes to sin how important the second table is, which is why we always run to commandment number six. It's inevitable. When we talk about sin, the first sins we talk about are the, are the six commandment sins. I'm filling up my drink right now, as you can see, but I'm too lazy to take the cap off. And so I'm, yep, yep. the problem with doing that is that you end up 
overfilling it, which I will have to mute and handle it later. But I, I want you to sort of catch this, though. This is a first table problem. They're going to take their ears off of Jesus and they're going to put their ears on something else. And all the other sins will fall from the first table problem that they have. They're, God's not going to be their God. They're not going to honor his name. And they're not going to not to cherish his word. After the first table has been cast aside, says Dr. Luther, the second table too is cast aside and lust takes over first and principal position. In this passage, therefore, it means that after they had turned their eyes away from God and his word, they turned them lustfully toward the daughters of men. There, there follows the unfailing result from the infraction of the first table, men go to violate the second. This is a great lesson from this. The first thing we compromise is the Lord and his words. The first thing we do is compromise on Jesus, and then all the other sins follow. Look, I don't ever want to slam the ELCA, so that's not what I'm doing right now. Um, when churches go liberal, the first thing they compromise on is Christ and his word. God, God's word, isn't the primary source of doctrine, or it has errors, or it has mistakes, or there are things that we don't like about it. And what follows is sins of the second table. That's what Luther points out is going on here. They take their ears off of the Lord in his words, and they end up in a different place, doing what they want to do all the time. So the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive. They looked at them and they were like, hubba, hubba. And they took wives from them. I don't know how I spilled on my desk, but I did. And God sees this and says, verse 3, And Yahweh said, My spirit, my ruach, will not judge. I like the word judge here. Um, in the Septuagint, it is kata mene. It will not reside. Um, my spirit will not judge the man um, to all eternity. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna deal with this forever. I, I'm. I'm. I, I've reached the point in which I. I. My spirit shall not continually judge man. Uh, judge in man, for he is flesh, and uh, but his days will be one hundred and twenty. Yesterday I made a comment. It's sort of a flippant one. And the comment that I made was, you know, it's going to get so bad that God's going to knock us down to 120 years. Um, and that is one way of reading this verse. That, look, I'm not going to contend with men forever. I'm going to, I'm going to knock them down to 120 years. But I... I I was convinced by Luther otherwise. Um, first of all, my spirit will not... I, I think the 120 years is the 120 years before he's going to wipe the world out. So the way I would see it is like he sets the countdown clock to 120. This isn't about how long Lestico is going to live or Cheryl's going to live. This is about God saying, you know what, I'm done. In 120 years, I'm done. Um, that's Luther's take on this. You can read it either way you want, and the world's not going to come to the end um, because that's not what's going on here. This is not a guide about you. This is about Christ. And Luther says this um, in his commentary. He says in Genesis 6-3, to understand the meaning of Scripture, the Spirit of Christ is needed. So, like, if this is about Jesus, then you are on the right track of understanding what's going on. If this is not about Jesus, 
then then you're going to be in real trouble. And and what is worse about this is that not that he threatens to destroy the world. It's that he was threatens to withdraw his spirit. God is most angry when he withdraws his word. Look, I would prefer famine and pestilence and sword to a famine of the world, word. Like, do you want famine, sword, death, or eternal damnation? Which would you rather have? This is Luther again. I mean, I was like, so like the worst thing in the world is that he withdraws his word. Um, he takes away his word, and therefore man is done. He's toast. The Lord threatens in this passage that the Spirit will no longer judge because men are unwilling to listen and cannot be improved. But when His Spirit has been taken away, the Spirit of prayer has also been taken away. For one who does not have the Word cannot pray. So my thought with this was like, I'm done with my creation. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with you. I'm done with Lessico. I'm done with Jacoby. I'm done with, with, um, with Cheryl. I'm done with Colonel. I'm done with Pat. I'm done with Grace. I'm done. When in actuality, this is, I'm withdrawing my spirit. This is worse. I'm not going to abide with them any longer. And this is Seth's line. Because Seth's line looked at Cain's line and was like, hubba hubba, where have you been all my life? And the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards when the sons of man came into the daughters of men and they bore children. And these were the mighty men of name, uh, uh, mighty men of old, the men of name. I want you to sort of when they left him when they left him he did not leave them and here they leave him to such an extent that he says, <laughs> we're not going to take it. Um, he, he says, I'm done. I'm pulling, back my, I'm pulling back my word from them. Thus these words and the thoughts agree beautifully, says Luther. The, 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 the preceding thought contains a threat. The Lord says in a passage, I'm no longer going to bear the contempt of my word any longer. I'm going to get back to the Nephilim. I'm not done. Uh, through their boundless um, efforts, my preachers, uh, through their boundless efforts, my preachers and my priests achieve nothing but um, scorn. Therefore, just as a father or a good judge would gladly spare a son, but the son's wickedness compels him to be severe, so I do not enjoy destroying the entire human race. I shall grant them 120 years during which they may rest, may come to their senses, and I may spare them. But they don't. And the Nephilim, I would not think of as, like, giants. They're the people, uh, the great... Um, The way I would, the way I would, I, the way I would, would take the Nephilim is I would just take them as um, the Nephilim. Um, and, and you could take them as, I, I would say like superheroes, men of renown. Um, they, they don't have to be supermen. They could just be well-known men. Um, I mean, 
men of myth. Um, but in this case, happened, but we don't hear about them. But the children of Israel know about them. Um, I would not take them as um, as superheroes or or demigods or the like. I would um, first I would take Noah as the greatest prophet that ever happened because he's um, or one of the greatest prophets up until this point because he preached universal punishment to the entire world and designated when that was going to happen. You like apples? How about those apples? But when it comes to the Nephilim, I would take them as um, men who just do great, do, who did great things. Um, they did great things. They were, they were heroes of their day. Um, so here's the, um, here's Luther. Such is my explanation, explanation of the giants or Nephilim in this passage as being not men of huge mass or body as in the passage in numbers, but unruly and mischievous men. Um, um <laughs> I'm not a jukebox. Um, uh, but pursue only their own desires and rely on their own power and strength. They sit in the place of supreme authority and have con control over empires and kingdoms. They even, uh, they, they even sort of grab spiritual power to themselves. They employ power against the church and against the word of God as they please. So he doesn't see this as like supermen. Instead, he sees them as tyrants, oppressors, and, and thieves. Um, Moses transfers this word from the usage of his time to the time before the flood with a slight change in me me uh, meaning. Um, they become like, and they become like evil people, Hitlers and the like. Um, and what I, what I would say is, um, This is the answer to the 120 years, though. All right. So God says, tick tock, tick tock. You got 120 years to get your stuff together. And what happens? It gets worse. It gets worse. It gets worse. Worse people come legendary bad people come. So God says, this got to stop. This is awful. And so into the world come legendary people who are bad. Legendary bad. And that's the way you should take the Nephilim if Christ is the center. If you want these guys to be giants, knock yourself silly. I don't, I don't really care. But they could be infamous people. And we've used that word. We use that word in English too. That person is an intellectual giant. That means their intellect is super duper crazy big. That person is a giant in Lutheranism. Are they actually a giant? Like are they are like are like they they like ginormous? No, they're just like a giant. I remember. Um, I remember somebody who met. Um, Daniel Preuss, who was so in awe of meeting Daniel Preuss that they sat and grabbed his hand and just wept because they were so happy to be meeting somebody who was such a pillar of their, uh, a witness to their faith. Now, if you take these as, as big giants, ho, 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 green giant, then, you know, um, Um, if you if you take them as giants I'm okay with that uh, that's the use of the word later on the Philistine was described as a giant um, uh, 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 Goliath but here I think 
it's not a bad argument if you understand these are the line of Cain and these are the line of Seth and the sons of men see the daughters of uh, the sons of the sons of God see the daughters of men they put a little Marvin Gaye on and they they go at it that their children are awful. And all of them, Judy, are wiped out by the flood, which means that the Nephilim that are mentioned in Numbers and the Nephilim that, that the fact that, 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 that um, look at me, I'm going high. What's his face was a, a Goliath was a freak of nature is just a freak of nature. Uh, why is Goliath so big? So that da God could be glorified in his, in his death. But are they Nephilim from here? No. Which means whether we solve this issue or not, doesn't really matter because all of these people are going to be wiped out by the plague. This is like watching the movie Titanic where you already know the ending. Only eight people are going to live through this. Near, far, wherever you are. And the law, the Lord Yahweh saw the great wickedness, evil on the earth, of men on the earth. And all of their forms and purposes were of their thoughts, of their hearts, were only raw, only evil all the days. Thanks, Grace, for the compliment. I will walk 500 miles and I will walk 500 more. So the Lord sees the wickedness of man is great on the earth and that every intentional thought in his heart is evil every day. Call Hayom. Every day. Yom. Day. Every day. And this, Dr. Luther says, oh, by the way, I want to go back to the Nephilim for one more Luther quote. Please forgive me. By contrast, the Nephilim or giants not only usurp the glorious name of the church on the grounds that they descended from the patriarchs, but they also wield authority. They are the lords with the power they oppress the wretched church. And Moses calls them um, Nephilim uh, of the world uh, or in the world or worldlings uh, temporarily mighty men. Now, to this passage, where's, and, and, and when, 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 I, I want to I just, sort of, I want to sort of revel in this for a second. Because what Luther sees in this text shamed me. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil every day. And Luther says, this passage of which we made use against free will, about which Augustine writes that without grace, the Holy Spirit is incapable of anything but sin. And there it is. I'm going to withdraw my spirit from them because they're only wicked all the time. Where's the free will? Where's the spark of good? Where's that little bit that if it's just blown on will catch fire toward God? Where's the ability to believe in God, to make a decision for God? Where is it? Well, the wickedness of man is great over all the earth. And every intentional thought of his heart 
is continually every day. And that's not just then. That's today. That's right now. That's do you have a heart? If you do, then every intention of it is evil all the day. Every day. thought I had my um, Curious George shirt on, which says um, it's a picture of Curious George and he's got a, a um, banana. It's all day, every day, he says. I like this shirt because I don't like Curious George. And it's best to, um, to grab hold of your fears and conquer them lest they become clowns that haunt you for all time. We're going to start with this verse tomorrow because I don't want you to miss this. Um, this is not just that this is true after the flood. This, is, this means without the grace of God, only evil from us all the time. Only evil all the time. Where's your free will then? Well, your inclination is to do evil it's you're magnetized toward evil. You are drawn to it. You want to do it. They did. You did. I do. And the only hope is that Christ would come and save us. Because without Christ, we'll be lost. Because our inclination, our desire is evil all the time. All day, every day day the two churches the church of Seth Enoch Lamech and um, Noah the church of Cain death ending in another Lamech who is a greater murderer than all the other ones do you think that COVID-19 is from God? Uh, well, I, I think you could think of it, Jennifer, as judgment from God, as long as you don't think that that's the final word from God. Um, what I mean by that is, is there's no way that you could say that God isn't calling us to repentance. I mean, he's certainly rocked our world with it. But is that the final word from him? What's the gift in it? If, 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 if God sent COVID-19 to um, call us out of our sins, what's the end game? Well, the end game is that we would repent and call on him as Savior, which we are endeavoring to do every single day. So I would not, um, I mean, you can't, you can't say with absolute certainty that God's not somewhat behind um, COVID-19. Um, I prefer to think of it as he will take the evil of this world. Um, and sickness isn't caused by God, but it is a consequence of sin. He uses it to repent us. Um, I would just look at it in terms of he uses it to bring about good. And a lot of good is going on. And we'll see a lot of good in this. Um, and, and that's and that's not because we have seen it. It's because he says he works good out of evil. I want you to get the app, the Higher Things app. I want you to go to uh, your favorite app store and search Higher Things. Okay, um, your favorite app store that is Google or um, uh, um, iTunes or or Amazon. Find your favorite um, app store, search Higher Things, Dare to be Lutheran, and you'll find our app, which will point you to all the excellent content in Higher Things. And so I think you should do that and maybe even hit the donate button and give as well. Uh, give first to your congregations, but when you have some left, give to those who, um, um, those, those groups that are helping you through this time. And you can also get to the app from www.higherthings.org. Have a blessed day, and we will see you tomorrow.